Hey everyone, welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Ty Haney, who founded the activewear brand Outdoor Voices in 2014 at just 24 years old, and she's currently the founder of Try Your Best and Joggy, which I'm so excited to learn more about. But first off, Ty, thank you so much for being here with us today. I know you have a crazy busy schedule, and I'm just really excited to reconnect with you. Same. Thank you for having me. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think people who are followers of yours and who are um, fans of yours from the OV days, which a lot of our community is, have probably followed along your journey into like OV and then kind of transitioning out. And I know there was a lot there, a lot of tension, a lot happened, and you so graciously shared from your perspective during that time as well. But at that same time, you became a mom. Now you're mother of two and you're la- you have like two companies. Um, so I'm just curious, like, how was that transition out of the business? We met actually like in between or right before maybe like right before the pandemic for like a hot mm-hmm. second at Sky Team. And um, you had mentioned at that time, a, you know, a little bit about like your experience with anxiety, actually. And so I'd love to start a, with that because I think that you were coming into motherhood with, you know, this experience that maybe like letting go of all that kind of made you um, be able to be more present. I don't really know that experience. I'd love to hear from you if you could share with us how that whole thing just like, you know, having um, it hindsight, how you feel. Yeah, um, I must, I was pregnant at the time, right? I remember you sitting in the little lounge pit. Yeah. Conversation yeah. Pit. I just am taking myself back to that time real quickly. But uh, my first baby was a girl. And for whatever reason, that was a much more difficult pregnancy. The second baby's a boy. And I felt like I was surfing like emotional hormonal waves, like to the nth degree, it was completely insane. So I had a lot going on kind of career wise at that at that time. And we can get into some of that. Um, but I've, I've generally been able to kind of manage kind of self manage anxiety and stress via activity, which is why like, I started OV in the first place, like, I've, I've, I firsthand need to move on a daily basis to kind of like, manage the demons, the stress, etc. But what I found for myself having a girl, like that was something that couldn't necessarily be managed by activity. So that that was a wild, wild time. And then on top of that, kind of the stress of um, kind of the dynamic, you know, at the board level without our voices and, and kind of am I going to stay here or not? That was a whole lot going on. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to kind of be on the other end of that other side of it. It's interesting because you and I are the same age. So at that time, um, it's kind of like your Saturn return, you know, your Saturn return like starts at 28, around 28, but it like can happen anytime in between like 28 to 30, um, a little after. And so it seemed like from an outside perspective, because what happens with, I don't know if you're familiar. I don't, with, like, tell me. Yeah, tell me more. Well, it's like a solar return in a way where it takes like 28 years to go around. And okay. so the sun and so or it's not your solar return is your birthday but anyways 28 years of like some new cycle basically every 28 years you have this new cycle and so during that time either you're like in this mode of creation so a lot of people actually might like have that creativity that comes through with children or you know some big life transition happens and so it's really interesting that you were going through these like both these transitions at the same time but being a mother of two myself, like I think that I really believe that everything happens for a reason and brings us to, you know, where we are now. And so it's just beautiful to to know women actually, like a friend of mine who was pregnant actually around the same time as you, like came into it. She used to work with me, then the pandemic hit and um, I had to furlough a lot of my team or whatever. And so just seeing these like pandemic babies and having more time with our children while also you know, you're a busy body, you're in a constant mode of creation and wanting to bring more into the world. So I'm just really excited to kind of get into like, how you've been able to like be a mother, a present mother and have another 
beautiful boy now and grow your family while also bringing in this mode of like, I'm not done creating work wise. Mm -hmm. And I have so much more to share. And like having this sense of going back to like, what exactly is it that I want to share with the world? Because right now, and like, I have no idea what Web3 is, you know, I think, you know, it's been in the realm and in the media and like talking, but I really just don't understand it. And I, so I'd love to kind of get into what brought you into that aspect of like, this is what I want to do. And how long did it take? Yeah. Um, was that in between babies? Tell us yeah. more. Sure. Um, so I've spent the last, what is it? Eight plus years building out our voices. And in looking back at that experience, one, it was awesome. Um, I, I loved it. Met so many awesome, talented people. And, and we had a lot of fun. I, I'd say our number one strength was in our community, community building. So like, we had this very passionate, engaged, enthusiastic kind of fan base or community base engaged around kind of the, the motto doing things. And, you know, our positioning, this idea of freeing fitness from performance really struck a chord. Um, I at kind of at the end of my time at Outdoor Voices started to be interested in the crypto space. I wasn't like certain I was going to enter it, but um, I started to see, the, I guess the headline for me in terms of what I love about Web3 is this idea of community ownership and in web three using kind of the, block, the blockchain technology there are these products where or projects where users of a product or project become the owners of that project project or product and so aligning incentives in that way from a community building standpoint and like a fandom and loyalty around a product makes a lot of sense and so i started to connect the dots in terms of my experience brand building knowing kind of you know that the, the like wonderful things about building a brand in today's world, but also the challenges. And then starting to play kind of in the Web3 space, bringing the two together. And essentially what we've decided to do is create a toolkit. We call them Web3 community commerce tools that allow brands and communities to come together, build together, and then everybody kind of shares in the upside. And, and pretty simply, it's about aligning incentives. Um, and then one, one thing coming off the OV experience and, and from a direct to consumer standpoint, a lot of brands are experiencing this today. We've been really focused on customer acquisition. So like at what price can I buy the next customer through Facebook or Instagram? That's becoming increasingly more expensive, not a sustainable way to grow a business and ultimately doesn't net kind of long-term sticky customers that are with you forever. And so what we through TYB really are focused on is how do we create, create tools that allow brands to directly connect with their most loyal fans, essentially give them bounties or missions to help them grow, and then incentivize them for helping to drive that growth. So it's a much more efficient and fun way to play on the, on the end user side. It's a, kind of almost like a game with your favorite brands where you're getting kind of incentives and rewards for helping the, to build the brand um, generally. So how did you, before I get into all my questions about that, cause I want like kind of more specifics in terms of like, if I am a brand, or a consumer, how I get those incentives. But how did you like educate yourself? Uh, you know, you mentioned you were in to um, crypto, uh, you know, towards the end, but like, what, where did you go to learn? Because I think a lot of people are hungry for it, but not sure where, I mean, there's a lot of seminars happening and whatever, but like, how did you um, figure out like, who's really knowledgeable about it and who you want to learn from when yeah. it comes to this thing and who like, you know, because a lot of people are interested. Yeah, of course. Um, I was lucky. Actually, uh, my partner in TYB, one of my partners called, his name is Zach Davies. He's our COO, CFO. He he um, ran ops and finances at Outdoor Voices. And so we have spent a lot of, a lot of time building together, um, enjoy it. And, and he actually turned me on to kind of the crypto space. So um, started investing in Avalanche which is one of the blockchains. And then, and then like, once you kind of dive in a bit, there's a lot of ways to kind of, th there's a lot to explore. Um, let me put it that way. But I started seeing things like pool suites. I don't know if you're familiar with them where they, they started to introduce collectibles for a membership and it unlocked crazy cool experiences. And then things like board Ape Yacht club, et cetera. Um, it was just really fascinating to see kind of this community that essentially, you know, showed their belonging via a collectible that lived in their wallet and then was able to grow like crazy fast because everybody was incentivized to help the company grow. So 
I, I kind of at that point just started kind of connecting dots, hopping around, learning as much as I could. There's some really great, um, I would say, newsletters, both on, on Substack, Mirror, and then just directly sent to your, to your email. One guy called Rex Woodbury in particular is fantastic. And then A16Z pumps out a lot of really good content um, related to the crypto space, uh, as well as this guy, Jesse Walden, um, and this woman, Legion. They're kind of like at the forefront of like a fully decentralized future um, and really have set the tone in a lot of ways for what Web3 can can do um, to make the world a better place. So that's kind of rattling off uh, some of the folks that that were interesting to me early on. So Try Your Best is trying to bring on both the commu- brands and their community to join, mm-hmm. right? Like, is that part of what your specific role is in the space is, or is it that the brands are also helping to bring their audience on as well. Like, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it, it's a B to B to C. So we're speaking both to the brands and to uh, the end user. So think of it like PayPal, for instance, like, how are you facilitating kind of a new type of engagement between kind of these stakeholders and pushing kind of the, the levers on both sides. Um, but really kind of out of the gates, the brands are bringing kind of their audience into the platform. So like, mature kind of established brands are bringing their top 1% of customers or their community and and ambassador kind of folks. They're bringing um, them into their own community channel on TYB. One thing really to call out that's important from a brand perspective in terms of why you'd build on the blockchain is if you're building, let's say, quote unquote, quote, community kind of in the Instagram world or even on TikTok, if I'm a brand and have put a lot of effort to building kind of to a certain amount of followers, if I decide to leave Instagram at any point, those relationships are not mine. And so building on the blockchain means as you bring your fans into this community owned channel, you start to engage them, um, build more and more trusted relationships. You at any point can take kind of that relationship building that community and move it wherever you'd like. So um, that's kind of like one one key piece to understand here in terms of why you would build on the blockchain versus a centralized you know, kind of version of that. So you're saying like the blockchain technology is because it's, oh, is it open? Yeah, it's, it's open. Mm-hmm. So you move it. Okay, got it. That yep. makes sense. And right now only a few brands are on there, just your Joggy brand. And that's kind of like a proof of concept that you launched for Try Your Best? Or yep. is that just like, because you were also, I mean, I'm sure you're passionate about it. Yep. But um, tell us more about that. Yeah, coming off the OV experience, I I had wanted to build um, kind of in the energy supplement space, and I can chat more specifically about that. Um, and at the same time, realized like, wow, we can really we can really go help kind of build true community for brands using Web three. And so they were kind of parallel path, and then like happened to fit nicely like within one another or next to each other. Um, so we have incubated Joggy. Um, and then used it essentially as an R and D. It, it continues to be kind of like our R and D for refining the experience and like um, really kind of driving the right engagement and, and kind of metrics within this experience that then starts to go live with additional partners. So, given this is such kind of a new way to engage, having case studies and kind of like models to point back to in terms of what success looks like, what can this new way of building do from a, a business building perspective? That was really kind of the beautiful um, thing about Joggy, about Joggy coming to life at the same time. And then we have about 12 or more pilot partners going live starting in July um, that are both large kind of established retail, kind of mid-sized D2C, and then some smaller opportunities. That's exciting. And all while you're building this, Mm -hmm. um, like when did you start on the project? When you were pregnant with number two, um, like after you had number one, like how did that, you know, all come together? Let's see. So, so Joggy kind of coming off the OV time, it was something to like go sink my teeth into and and keep me busy. I'm I'm not so great if I'm not like very busy and and building something. Um, And so Joggy came before TYB probably a number of months before, but I think we formally started TYB um, like at the top of last year, February 2021, um, raised a first kind of initial pre-seed round in May and then have been off to the races since. And 
I want to, you know, you were really public about your experience with what you learned from your last, you know, in terms of like your last business and raising money and the type of funding that you were willing to take on. Like, how did you use that experience with what happened and into like your new and first raise with TYB? Mm -hmm. Um, A few things. We had like everybody and their mother on the cap table at Outdoor Voices. So we had a lot of people around the table. Um, And that's good, like from an awareness standpoint, but it can be challenging to manage. And so ultimately what became difficult at Outdoor Voices was one, kind of the board dynamic was challenging. We all had kind of different views on, on how to grow Outdoor Voices and what the future looked like. And then two, we had raised a lot of money and from so many people that ultimately like I diluted myself too much. So ownership is king and like raising the right amount of money is something that I always thought like the more money, the better, but obviously like it needs to make sense from a total control and ownership perspective as well. And so a few things I learned, we raised probably too much money um, too fast at Outdoor Voices. And then ultimately like the ownership piece became meaningful because as soon as you lose control, you really do lose control. As you may or may not know, we've been sharing the benefits of Saffron with our community for a little while now. Growing up in a Persian family, I'd been aware of the benefits of Saffron because of its prevalence in my mother's cooking. But as we began on the journey to create our own line of Saffron-based products, I began to learn the powerful science behind the plant. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years, and now the research is backing it up, proving that just 30 milligrams of saffron per day is a natural source for enhanced emotional and physical well-being. At the fullest, we believe that incorporating ancient wisdom into our modern lives is one of the most powerful and accessible paths to healing. We also believe that everyone's journey is unique. So for our latest launch, we've created a line of saffron products in a variety of formats, to help you curate saffron in your personal daily routine. Warm Feelings is our saffron latte powder and comes in individual sachets and in larger sustainable glass jars. Made with just certified high-grade saffron, organic coconut powder, and cardamom, it's the perfect coffee alternative and feel-good start to your day. If you prefer to pop a pill, Kinder Thoughts is our 30-day supply of saffron capsules and a super simple way to support your body and mood with the power of saffron. And if you're looking to strengthen your immune system, try our Mindful Immunity Syrup. This healing blend uses saffron to reduce inflammation, but also harnesses the power of an ancient Middle Eastern berry called barberries to fight infection, along with sea buckthorn and elderberries, all in a base of Manuka honey to aid in antibacterial healing. It's a true immunity powerhouse. Honestly, at the moment, I'm using each of these products on a daily basis, depending on my needs. And to help you begin your own saffron journey, we're offering a discount of 15% off just for our podcast listeners with code the fullest podcast at checkout. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. That makes sense. So this time around, you're more, you're, you know, less likely to give up as much. I mean, you have more experience. So you're probably uh, people who are investing have something to go off of. So that's also an easier sell. So how do you like going off raise? Like we've had VCs on here that have raised. So we have people that are interested in like building brands and learning more about women that are interested in learning more about like funding and have no idea about it. So how did you um, this time around, like decide how much, like you're saying you raised too much money last time, like Mm -hmm. this time, how did you decide how much you needed? I mean, obviously you have, you know, people that are advisors and whatnot, but you know, sure. Um, I don't think like the total dollar amount necessarily equates between Outdoor Voices and TYB. That said, like I was a first time founder. And so like doing things for the first time, obviously, like you're going to learn a lot, make mistakes, et cetera. So having eight years of like being the CEO, running a, a fast paced, high growth company, raising money, et cetera, like there's a lot of learnings. And and so I'm like much more well equipped for what that means today. Um, for the for the type of company that we're building in, in kind of the tech space and um, what that means from a you know requirement to to grow uh, brands etc and and really grow this like we are gonna raise money we actually just closed a 10 million dollar round on Monday which is 
good timing given the um, markets are total, they're scary right now. Um, but we are, we are raising money. I think it's just a much more informed way to go about it. Like I've been very methodical and thoughtful about who we've brought on and like keeping the cap table very small um, and just owning that dynamic more so controlling kind of like, you know, like who's on the board and who we let into the company. And that also goes for talent and hiring as well. But the second time around is meaningfully different. So I, I feel like a long while back, people were always like, I always, I always invest in kind of second time um, entrepreneurs. And, and I get it because you, you have battle wounds or battle scars and, and are much more informed. That makes sense. So while you're building all this, how's home life? Like you just recently had your boy, you have two kids now. Like, what does it look like at home in Arizona on a day to day basis? Yeah, we moved to Tucson from Austin kind of in the, in the middle of COVID really to have more space to play and then mountains to climb. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and so having mountains and, and hike, the ability, ability to hike and climb things and really get perspective is something quite meaningful to me. That's something, honestly, I missed about Austin, though Austin's a really cool town. Um, and so we, we've been in Tucson and it, it's funny, I, I joke, my social life's just gone way down um, living in Tucson, but we've actually met some really lovely people uh, that, that came back to Tucson. I think originally we're from Tucson, lived in LA, New York, and then COVID kind of brought them back home. Um, so it's been, it's been surprisingly awesome. Tucson's a treasure. And I think like you had mentioned early on, COVID in, in some ways, it's obviously been very difficult, but in some ways has been a blessing because uh, my husband's a touring country singer, his band's Midland, and um, he's on the road quite often. And so we got this like, you know, time with Sunny, our daughter, and, and also with Champy where both of us were like fully focused on her um, and here and present. And, and so in a lot of ways, that was the bright, that has been the bright side of, of the past two years. And now you just like, obviously are working remotely. What does that look like day to day with just like support? Mm -hmm. um, I, for me, we, we have two nannies and we didn't until recently, but um, it's funny. Like, I feel like when you start a company, like you, you kind of get through kind of the early, early innings and then like forget how hard that was. <laughs> and so you, you start it again and you're like, oh, there's a reason I totally blacked that out. It's kind of like birth for me at least. Um, and so totally. it's been a lot of hours and a lot of effort. And with the added, obviously, like responsibility of these two kids, two lovely kids. But I I fortunately have someone that have, have always liked to do a lot of things at once. Um, and so it's really worked nicely for me. But I've been very... Um, I, I have, I, we're in a fortunate position to, to have kind of full-time nanny support. And that's really the only way that, that this works. And, and so, yeah, we, we have a team kind of helping us and, and it's really great. Sonny goes to school, Champy's here. Um, he's five months, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and I think it all comes down to energy management. Like that's something I, I have to fully focus on is just like, like I have to exercise to get energy, which I think, you know, if you're not someone who exercises often, like that seems counterintuitive, but that will always be kind of a through line for me personally. And then also from a career perspective is, is movement on a daily basis and energy management. Yeah. Um, I kind of the same because I have two, a 10 month old and a three and a half year old. And mm -hmm. I just got um, a, a full-time nanny and now I have like kind of two and we have a team to support us. And I find myself feeling guilty though. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, a lot of people, and I know a lot of women entrepreneurs who feel like, oh, should I be at home or should I be with my kids more? Or, but I also think it's really interesting because like you said, your social life in Tucson is like not that much, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like your business also is able to get a little bit more of that in your kids too, because a lot of people are like trying to navigate also feeling guilty for like not going out with their friends all the time or whatever. And so in a way, um, I think like you said a little bit of like having more family time instead mm -hmm. of like a social light really probably helps too. I, I don't feel the guilt, which is fortunate because I, I feel for people who do and I get that a lot of people do, but I also like we have the weekends fully together. So it's not like full, full time. So we, 
I get a healthy dose of, of mom time, which is awesome. Um, and I think working from home, like, you know, you, you see them kind of throughout the day, et cetera, which is, which is quite special. Yeah, that is really nice. So, um, I want to get into Joggy a little bit because that was your initial brand that you wanted to bring out. And then it turned into, you know, try your best, which is so awesome. So tell us about Joggy and the science behind CBD and movement. And I know, um, I believe you just launched a new product too, mm -hmm. right? Today. Yeah. They're called Rechargies. Um, yeah. So, so I, we're kind of working on a collection of products and brands, Joggy being the first, um, it's a plant-based energy company. So energy as in supplements and it's, it's quite cool. I think like coming off of the outdoor business experience, there's a lot that looks and feels quite similar. So really it's meant to inspire, enable, um, and kind of catalyze your ability to be active and then to recharge, um, relax, kind of recover from the activity. So we have five kind of starting lineup SKUs um, that support what I call like the full spectrum of activity. That said, um, all, all five SKUs do have full spectrum CBD. And that isn't generally something that's paired with an energy product. But about four years ago, I started um, running and or I started testing kind of different amounts of THC and CBD before runs. A friend of mine had, mine had recommended this. And I found that at kind of the right dose or formulation, um, it could conjure up this like slightly euphoric feeling that felt similar to a runner's high. And runners high, I like, you know, maybe felt a few times running it, like cross country in high school. It's really kind of that euphoric, joyful feeling that after six miles of like hard, intense aerobic activity, you're finally like, I could run forever. I'm the Energizer Bunny. Um, and so I thought that was really cool. And I, the benefits pretty simply were I'm enjoying my activity to run more and then I can go for longer. So from an endurance perspective, it was quite meaningful. So that really kind of was the inspiration for Joggy, you know, out of the gates. Uh, our first product is called Runner's High. Um, and then we have, uh, and Runner's High really is meant to be taken ahead of activity to essentially conjure up those feelings. Ready Steady is the second one. And it's more kind of your traditional CBD use case um, to kind of take the edge off. What we found in our research is a lot of people have like crazy anxiety ahead of going to like group classes or even working out. And so Ready Steady you take it before and it just like mellows you. It, it like slightly, it takes the edge off is the best way to describe it. And then there's three other products, but I think just to speak to kind of the, the science behind it, one thing that was really important as I had been a CBD skeptic kind of until learning more was finding really an expert in, in terms of manufacturing and testing. And so we work with this lab called Sante Lab out of Austin. And what's really interesting is the technology that, that they have brought to us, it's a water-based technology. And traditionally, uh, CBD lives in oil, which if you go back to science class, oil and water don't mix. And so water, this water-based technology makes it four times more uh, bioavailable or accessible to your body, which means faster acting and potent. So you actually feel it, which I think is important for a lot of people who have tried CBD and been like, I don't feel anything, it's snake oil. Uh, uh, one more thing kind of on the technology is they essentially break the cannabinoids into a billion particles that then are um, put into what they call a lipid encapsulation technology, which protects kind of the quality of the cannabinoids. And then that lives in this water-based formula that then is delivered to your system. So the bioavailability is a big thing here. And when you look at the drops, they're white versus kind of a traditional oil. And many people are like, what the hell is this? Is it rotten? But no, there's something from a technology standpoint, meaningfully different about how we deliver the cannabinoids to, to what is out there today. Yeah, I noticed that they're liposomal, which is what you were explaining. Yep. Yep. And um, I've just being in this space, like I've been told that liposomal supplements are the most just similar to like getting an IV, basically. Like you yep. feel it, you orbit, like you said, but more bioavailable. So I thought that was really interesting. And yeah, I really like that idea. I was surprised that you went the CBD route when like the products mm -hmm. launched, but then like mm -hmm. looking at the products, it is so unique. Like you said, putting that in a, in a supplement for activity yeah. and people like taking pre-workout stuff. People like having like the joystick for post-workout, like something for like soreness and stuff. And it, 
it makes so much sense. And the type of technology that you're using is different. And THCV, which is like, it's like a newer, right? Or different strain that's not in many. Exactly. So it's a newer or more, more recently researched cannabinoid, THCV. It's not to be confused with THC, but it's um, kind of main benefit in kind of research to date is its energizing properties. And so when we went to Sante and said, hey, here's what we're looking to create, like the perfect formula for the runner's high feeling, um, that's what they came back with. And, and it's amazing. Um, I think we launched two months ago. Uh, all of the reviews on runner's high are hundred percent. It's I'm not joking. It's an incredible product and, and no one, I think there's like one other company using THCV right now. Um, but that's how we make CBD energizing as you add additional kind of amounts of THCV. And so it, it's very unique. And yes, I, I was anticipating and certainly got some like, you know, feedback around like, what the hell are you doing in CBD? So lame. But Ultimately, like, I think it is a really powerful tool for unlocking kind of movement within people, but there's been so much baggage within the space in the past. So we're very much in crypto and CBD. I'm into kind of very wild west um, uh, spaces totally. right now, but I like to play. I like to play here. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting too, because just like even um, like selling CBD, right? It's just like a yeah. total, like, at one point we did an event with a CBD company and I like got shut down off of mm -hmm. Shopify and like Amazon was freaking out and they were just like, no, the payment processors are a nightmare. So it's a big deal to take that on, you know? And I, and I agree with you. So we, um, all of our products at the fullest are saffron based mm -hmm. and I know you said it. And so saffron and CBD actually are very similar because they're both working with your endocannabinoid system mm -hmm. and they do similar things. It's about calm, everything you said. It's like about calming your nervous system down so that you can focus. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the research is so similar where I know this is the same with CBD where basically um, they're really great for mood support and focus, but what they're doing, like they've done research against like things like Ritalin and Adderall, and they've found that they're anti-stimulants that are able to do the same thing because of that like calming down effect. It's so beautiful. And so I agree with you. I think that that's really cool that you're using that for movement and um, you know, the technology is amazing. And going back to try your best, I, I really think that that obviously was like you said, the best um, thing that came out of OV is the community around it and people feeling included and like, part of going into a store or shopping online with your product and having like that on when you go for a run or go to yoga class or whatever is feeling that you're like part of this community that accepts you. Um, I don't know if you know Zach Bush, but I just did a podcast with him the other day and he was just like explaining beautifully how really like what it comes down to is that deep down we're constantly ingrained at a young age that we're separate, mm -hmm. that not connected and it goes against like natural law where we are all connected and like how I feel is going to affect how you feel and so this sense of community and camaraderie and um, any company that can really do that not just for like profits but really bring their customers together will really be able to thrive um, in so many ways and like you said do something that's wonderful for the world so it's really cool that you kind of like bottled that Mm -hmm. and then took it on to like create the platform that enables other companies to do that. And I'm super intrigued to see how that goes. And yeah, I just like kind of want to learn before we kind of sign off, like how that works, you know, for yeah. let's say you're listening to this podcast, you're a consumer of Joggy or mm -hmm. any brand that's like about to join your platform. Like, what do you do? Like mm -hmm. you, you know, or, or do you go on that platform or do you go on to like you try your best and then see what brands are on there yeah so in the future you'll be able to go directly to tyb and kind of join brands teams um right now we're still in beta so we're being very kind of thoughtful about the go-to-market for these brands and and the use cases one thing i'll go just kind of quickly on really kind of my belief is that the future of brand building is about two things co-creation and incentivization and that's what crypto unlocks everything is going to start to be truly community-led 
And that's something we did really well at Outdoor Voices from a, we had this like multi, many thousand kind of distributed network of people who would host events on our behalf. And so like, we'd say, here's what an event looks and feels like, go take it, bring it to life. This exercise dress event on campus, like make it yours. And so people felt like empowered hosts, which then became the most valuable way for new customers coming into Outdoor Voices. So that netted four times more valuable customers than an Instagram or Facebook customer. So that was meaningful. And then if you think about this sense of belonging, I tie back to another OB example is like, you would it, you would only get a doing things hat if you came and, and uh, participated in, in an activity with us. And so then people with um, the blue doing things hat, when you saw someone else on like the trail, you'd high five, like, hey, we're in the same club. Tying that to, to crypto, I very obviously see kind of that physical blue doing things hat, your souvenir kind of a relationship with a brand and other people as part of that community, moving to something digital that lives in a wallet. So blue doing things hat lives in a wallet and unlocks kind of additional experiences. So that blue doing things hat in your wallet could mean that it's your ticket to kind of the next exercise event, or it could mean it unlocks a private shopping page kind of on the brand's website. Uh, what really interests me kind of about that collectible piece is it becomes this almost like vehicle for experience. It, it allows you to like not only sell the legging, but bring it to life and, and uh, coordinate a certain group of people getting there. Um, so one thing like NFTs, I know have a lot of baggage and the sustainability around them, but, but that's not the sustainability piece is not true. We're built on Avalanche, which is the most sustainable blockchain. It's fast. It doesn't cost a lot, um, et cetera. And, and it's really the only way that, you know, we can do what we do with the product. But over time, you will absolutely be able to come into TYB and join the teams of brands. Out of the gates, it's a bit more protected um, as we kind of work out the kinks within the product and, and really focus on what's that magic moment. How do, how do we build communities around this, these brands that are self-sustaining and truly community-led? So I don't know if that answers your question, but, but that kind of ties a few pieces together in terms of the experience of TYB. Okay, just to clarify though, so basically right now, let's say Joggy is on there. Right. You have actual products, physical products that people can buy from Joggy's yep. website. Yeah. Joggy as a platform on TYB is mm -hmm. like, for example, um, something you give to someone. It's all digital and only in their wallet. Yeah. So T Joggy purely uses TYB to manage and grow their community. Right. And so yeah. that that's like the simplest way to think about it. And for Joggy, I'll tell you kind of how we how we let people in initially. We sold 500 founding member collectibles. And so there was this cute little animated Joggy, doggy, uh, Joggy Doggy, forgot the doggy, um, that you could buy for $250 to be a founding member. You're then brought into the channel. You help the headline being revenue-based reward. So as Joggy grows, you get 5% of Joggy's revenue, um, which is quite meaningful and, and quite new. The second piece being you get to come in and help shape both the TYB experience as well as future Joggy product. And then there were two other perks, one around a free product at launch and then um, friends and family discount or team discount in perpetuity. So by buying this collectible and it landing in your wallet, you have the rights to this whole kind of suite of really interesting perks. What becomes really interesting over time is there's only 500 of them. There will be kind of addi additional additions of as we grow the community, but with less perks. That's something that, let's say three years from now, uh, someone could buy from you. And that's like an interesting way to kind of capture, you know, tangible value beyond what you're, what you're receiving for your interactions within the tool. Okay, got it. So, and the, when that person buys it, like you said, it's tangible. So you take it out into the real world and that... Right. You essentially could sell it from sell it, meaning it would go from your wallet to somebody else's and you're collecting dollars for that trade. OK, through Avalanche. Uh, th it depends. There's it'll become kind of multi chain from a blockchain perspective. So wallets will become multi chain. Um, but all we need to know kind of on the end, end user side is like someone's buying that collectible and those rights associated with that collectible and transferring that collectible to a new wallet. The wallet the wallet thing is totally new, but it's it's yeah. coming fast and furious for us, which is, I mean, it, it's a wallet. It's where you store things. It, it's where you accrue value. So like that makes sense, but it's just a whole new world to be thinking of. I'm now collecting or earning these like souvenirs from brands that I love that unlock kind of very cool experiences or rights to things. Okay, that makes so much sense. 
because I think that that's kind of the hard part is also educating the consumer. Like if you're a brand on TYB, then also like kind of educating the masses on why this is, you know, something that you want to be part of in this totally. way. Yeah. yeah. And you'll see we're, we're, we've been very intentional with how this comes to life and it's very much rooted in collectibles that unlock certain experiences. And like, we're not talking about NFTs, like all of the complexity of crypto is meant to be obfuscated out of this uh, experience and like very much just focused on I'm I'm like earning or buying this collectible that then allows me to do these special things. Um, and that that for version one is all that it is, which, uh, yes, I think it's going to be really exciting as these new brands turn on and there's more kind of examples to point to that familiarize people with why they'd want to be part of it. Yeah. And it's also a gateway into being part of this world and why it should be interesting for them to go on and be curious about the other things. You know, totally. I think that just the conversation around NFTs, it gets so confusing that it's like, okay, you just might shut down or be overwhelmed. But this version one is like, oh, okay, I kind of get that. I yeah. can go on and do that. And then maybe you'll understand it more. That's so exciting. Yeah. And, and just say, that's something that I'm really passionate about. Like the crypto space is predominantly male. And so I'm really interested in like being kind of a funnel for women and in particular young women into this space, because from a financial perspective, there, there really is reason to, to play kind of in the crypto world um, uh, from a wealth creation perspective. And so if we can do that via the brands that you love, like that seems like a no brainer. But once you dip your toes in, like this is going to be a really exciting place to play. It's like a play to earn type um, relationship that's broader now than than just like buying from a, a brand to to get loyalty or to be loyal. It's now like, can I contribute to um, picking colors on, let's say, the exercise dress that comes out in a few months? Great. I get points for that. Can I get rewarded for seven days of consecutive activity? So brands can like engage their customers or bring their community into things around product development, mission based challenges community led content creation, et cetera. But instead of just like an Instagram, liking, 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 commenting for free, you're getting something for uh, your, your participation. You get points and those points unlock kind of like when you go into a store and get rewards. Yeah. There's different kind of redemption um, opportunities based on kind of what the brand wants, but brand coins live in your wallet. They're on chain. You can take them wherever you go over time. They become interoperable. So I have brand coins from one brand. I can transfer them to another brand wow. when the brands are to play together. And then there's a fiat off ramp that we're building. So in the same way that we've built kind of a very easy experience where I can use my credit card to buy a collectible, which is not common in the space. You usually have to have ETH or something. You're also going to be able to have X amount of brand coins and choose, do I want to convert them to dollars? And essentially that's that becomes quite meaningful from a, a dollar perspective and, and kind of to close the loop there, brands today are spending 30 to 40 percent of their dollars like directly into paid marketing. Our, our kind of um, recommendation and belief is that like those dollars are better served. Five percent of those dollars directly going to your most loyal fans is like going to meaningfully shift kind of what a healthy business and kind of growth for a business looks like. And to and be as effective as doing the 30 yes. to 40 percent. Totally. There's one essay by this guy called Kevin Kelly called A Thousand Truest Fans that is like the a potent version of this concept. Like if you have a thousand fans, you can have a business. You have to let you need the fans that will go by every single thing that you make, et cetera. But it's it's not that hard to have a self-sustained business if you focused on stoking the fire and, and real driving real loyalty with those thousand first people. Wow. I need to go and read that. Cool. Well, anyway, thank you so much for joining us, Ty. I really appreciate it. And I'm so excited to have learned more about what you're up to and um, educating me who has no idea about any of it. It feels like it all makes sense and something that I know that a lot of people are going to be so excited to be part of and probably already are. So thank you. 